there is an antitrust policy. Oh, we're recording again. Okay. So as a reminder, for all our meetings, we start with an antitrust policy note. Um, read it and understand it. And if you have questions, I'm asking the lawyer at your company. They can give you all sorts of wonderful answers. We also have a code of conduct. Um, the short answer is be excellent to each other. There is a lot longer, more details on that. Um, if you're curious, go ahead and read that. But if you're excellent to each other, you'll be fine. Announcements, as always, we have a Dev Weekly newsletter going out Friday. If you have any developer stuff, I'm going to try and get a hold of a uh, developer and promote stuff about your project. That's an excellent place to, to share data. Um, and we got two quarterly reports that are in. Um, Aroha was due last week, but it came in just before um, the meeting, so people didn't have time to review it. So we're going to review it again today. And Bevel again, um, right on time, but they came in late yesterday. So we will both do um, review it today and review it again next week. Um, everyone, is Sarah here. She likes to come sometimes. I think she was here last week, but she was late for the meeting by an hour because of time zone issues. Um, anyone have any questions on Aroha that aren't already covered in the comments? There's a, one open question about Burrow um, and a few other open questions. I think one of them got an answer. But does anyone have any questions or comments about the Aroha? Several questions. Seeing none. Um, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the comment section. Um, Sarah's been tagged. If she comes in during this meeting, we'll probably come back to this uh, topic so she can um, answer some of the questions live if she, if she does that. Um, and the next one is a hyperledger bevel um, that came in last night and I just added it to add everyone's check mark so they can say that they reviewed it or not. Um, no questions yet. We'll come back again next week to look at that. Um, coming up for rotation next week are both hyperledger grid and hyperledger transact. So those should be coming in hopefully by the 26th. We'll, we'll see how that goes. As far as presentations, there are no presentations and no decisions that were supposed to be made today. So from that, we'll move on to the discussion. Um, Arun wanted to have some time to talk about the security force, the security task force update. Arun? Thanks, Daniel. Um, can I share my screen? Yep. All right. Uh, so I had brief talk on this in our last security task force update, which uh, I guess Hart already knows about, but I wanted to quickly cover in this TSA call as well, and then call out some of the recommendations that came out of these meetings and open items that, uh, that, are, um, that are to be done as part of task force or probably um, move them as a separate task within or bring them up to TSA and have for open comments on these items, right? And some of these, um, recommendations are straightforward, non-controversial. However, there could be some which may require us to think through um, a bit more. For instance, um, one of the obvious ones are we needed to identify co key contact points from each project. They should, and the person or the contact point should be responsible for, um, I mean, we, we should make it a mandatory for any graduating project to have a representation in the security um, um, what we call as, let's, let's say we are forming a group of sec um, uh, mavens, security mavens across all projects. So we want a representation from each project available on that. And they are responsible for, for either fixing or delegating the tasks that are related to security. And it's, it's all on them, how they handle it. And I believe this is probably the straightforward approach that where the task force recommends that we have this um, as a mandatory uh, uh, criteria for any project that goes into graduation. And then one of the concern that uh, members brought up in the task force is related to depend about alerts. They're right now where uh, some of them are fixed, but slow and some of them are to be evaluated. So again, the action item can be assigned to the uh, point of contact from each project and we should define uh, time frameworks around that. That's one of the recommendations that came up as part of the task force. So um, one of the recommendations that Rai had initially put up in, in 
and the uh, opportunity section is also about re refactoring how we currently have um, our words security markdown files listed in each of the repository can we define or change the reporting template to match the one that OpenSSF team has recommended and it it eventually has the similar content where we they have either reported via email or reported via a platform such as github where you can report security vulnerability or uh, the other means right so this is something we can adopt um, to be consistent across or probably we can look into compare uh, these two and then say hey here is a new note that every project should adopt and then as a standard practice so that's the other recommendation and i know as part of mailing list there were few questions on is the current mailing list good enough or should we have an alternative to uh, using the mailing list so there is an open item on that in terms of exploring alternatives to use mailing list but the current um, um what do i say the the sentiment is to continue using it because that's uh, the main means of communication for anybody to report or come to us in terms of get get those issues reported and probably as part of the previous action item that is changing the template instead of having 24 hours response that may change to let's say the response would be given within three working days right so those would be certain changes for now but there is definitely an option which uh, task force recommended that we can have an alternate uh, to the mailing list if if there is any possibility now the other uh, major item that came up about in the task force multiple discussions is related to differentiating bugs from a critical vulnerability and there were many ideas proposed as to how we should make it possible of course there is no it's not possible for us to always have that distinction there always needs to be a human involved in identifying or probably evaluating that has it could also go into a specific project how they see that particular issue to be report that is reported and how they consider that issue to be so that was another open item and, and, and an opportunity that could improve. So over here, one of the approach or one of the one of the way we could improve this process was to introduce specific questions related to blockchain technology and, and evaluating or coming up with the CV score at the end. So um, the task force recommends that we have this. However, there is a mixed feeling that the scoring alone may not be good enough because we don't have a generic type model for each of the project each project have their own way of um, it, one the something that is applicable to one project may not be applicable to all the projects that we have at hyperledger however this was always an option to um, all the blockchain um, the core protocol projects that we have at hyperledger there is a possibility to Im I introduce this just so that we can have a distinction at what at some level now so so i believe these were uh, mostly non controversial ones are the straightforward ones which i believe all the projects would agree upon and there were few decisions that or so few recommendations that the task force had which might involve additional participants and not just the project team or the TSC and those include so currently Hyperledger does have a cross pro, I mean cross project bug bounty incentive program where people could go to hacker one platform and then report their issues um, however the concern over there was task force identified that some of them um, we, we need to establish a mechanism to identify what how to filter those or how to consider those issues that are reported to be whether to be considered as vulnerable or an regular issue right for instance is it just the documentation that needs the correction or is it that um it does not really affect my function of the protocol it's probably to do with the configuration somewhere I, if i modify that it's all good 
so those things are um, are to be distinguished. And there were recommendations in terms of, um, and there were talks, not recommendations, my correction, to probably consider not having this program at all. And there were also considerations where we have reviews done by each project team and then staff having to come and say the final go for incentivizing such uh, bounty programs. So um, I, based on the meeting, previous meeting records, I captured this one statement, but again, is this is a, this is something which we can always revisit and see what each project think of with respect to this, uh, the, the practice. And also we need to get agreement from the staff itself. Um, now, the other open item that was identified is that Hyperledger currently does not have a vulnerability disclosure process defined anywhere. And these things would help us in, in audits as well, where we can say, hey, this project took all the right measures when and, and, um, against this, let's say it, uh, the potential risk or, and, and these are the like mitigation steps that the project team took at that point in time. So this is one of the uh, bigger open items to be addressed. And the other recommendation was to have scorecards for each security guarantee of the project, right? So it may not go per project, right? We should probably define set of generic scoring guidelines for each project. And we need to come up with the list of, list of those criteria against which we need to score each project. For instance, uh, the CIA badging was one such criteria, right? Maybe we need to introduce those additional criteria and then recommendation is to look into what OpenSSF has been defining. Now, the next topic that is also kind of controversial is in terms of auditing, uh, the security audits. So um, since there is cost involved with security audits and that's a considerable amount to be spent who which project should be considered for for this process right should it be graduated projects only or should it be all projects and then those projects which have just incubated they come to tsc and ask for special approval to get their uh, software audited and even if tsc audits it would it be the final decision or would it have to go through governing board because of the budgeting concerns so that's an open item or that, uh, uh, I mean, that was the recommendation or the discussion tended towards in the task force that they, these projects come to TSC um, unless they are a graduated project, but still there is a clause that it needs to be approved by the governing board. And the last item, but not the least, that's related to binary distribution. So within Hyperledger, there have been there are projects which are releasing packages, the Java packages, Rust crates, and NPM packages, and each the the process involved over there are pretty much tied to a certain member in the community with somebody in the staff, but there is no generic uh, definition or generic mechanism through which somebody can go and some new project can come and start using that process. So this the process is not defined. It's rather known to certain people in the community and the staff, right? So that's an open item to be addressed. And in terms of, of apart for these gaps and opportunities, the tasks to be pending tasks to be done are we need to come up with those CV scoring um, questionnaires that need uh, that are to be introduced and define the scorecard card items that we said each project will list against them for and we need to come up with the policies for responsible vulnerability disclosures we need to define the signing process and and the final item is that throughout this task force discussion which happened over multiple months there were topics that were off from these um, four said items like topics used to go here and there because security, as you know, is a wide concern. 
like uh, we cannot really put boundary for security and say, hey, this is the scope of security. It can go across any layer. It can go to any aspect of your system from design to implementation to release and distribution everywhere. So security really cannot be boxed in, in something. So even though these are recommendations, there is a proposal to create a new working group for uh, the security process updates. So with that, I will take a pause and open up for comments. So one of the thing, one of the ask uh, over here is, um, I'll share the link in, in the meeting notes or probably put it over there. Please uh, go here and then add in your comments and do join our next meeting if you have any comments on any of these items and let's track exactly these tasks that are open and let's try target to close these tasks um, with recommendations. Is the next meeting tomorrow or next week? It is tomorrow, if I'm not wrong. Okay. And it's the same time of the day tomorrow? Um, yes, it's one hour, I mean, it's right now it's 7.30 p.m. in India, it should be 8.30. Okay, so an hour after when this meeting would happen. Cool. Right. Any other people on the call have comments on anything that was said or questions? How many people know in their project who gets security issues and who should get them? I know for fabric, I get them. It's Dave. Okay. But before I got it, it was really unclear who got them. Yep. Yeah. Part, you came up mute. Yeah. So I was just going to say that we have a lot of projects with only with none or a few people. Uh, and it would be nice if we had some sort of like, we had enough people for redundancy. Like Dave, I think something got sent when you were on vacation, uh, this, like last summer. Um, and it would just be nice if we had enough people on our, you know, right now it's the mailing list, but you know, whatever people decide, you know, how we want to communicate the security issues. It would be nice if we had enough people on all of the projects for some redundancy. But hot is hard enough to get one person per project. You want more than one. Uh, yeah, I do want more than one. I, I mean, I understand. Don't get me wrong. I just don't know if it's possible. That's all. I think at least we should have one person. Let's make sure that is the case. I think the biggest value of having someone on a project is you can get them a security issue that's inbound. And they can decide whether you should panic, whether you should mildly be concerned, and whether you should just um, not concern yourselves because it's a known issue for the category of applications. Um, and that's, you know, that's probably the first step of triage anyway. And that's where prompt response is really, really valuable, especially if it's like some really hot issue like the Log4j stuff that was going on um, in Besu. Um, to have someone realize it's like, oh my goodness, yes, we do use it. And I don't know if they could change it, but we can get a release rolled out really quick before the whole new cycle caught a hold of it. So that's probably one of the more recent examples of a security update where having a security person that can gauge the criticality and be able to raise the alarm if it needs to be raised is, is kind of important. So um, I think that would be one ask as, as, a, as a vice chair of all the projects is to at least get one name and, and let it be known to the security group. Um, I don't know that we have a security group, but you know, put it on your documentation and send it to the security email and maybe call into the security task force. Yeah, that was one of the other sort of things is that it might make sense to have a, a longer term security group. I don't know what, uh, what form that would take, um, but that might also make it easier to marshal people for the mailing list and other stuff. Yeah, and that opens up another can of worms 
um, we used to have working groups and we got rid of working groups um, in favor of task force. The task force need to have work product that results from them. But at the same time, having a standing group that has like the blessing of, of Hyperledger to meet together is like say a security group that meets or um, a regional chapter. There is value there, but you know, how would we go about that, I guess, is the next question. Uh, Nathan? Well, and this is an area where you know the security goes beyond just the CVEs and kind of just active code issues. There's a lot of best practices for blockchains that I think as, a, as Hyperledger, we ought to be saying things about like, how do we do key management correctly? And how do we make sure that the types of continuity that our blockchains rely on are part of the security audits of the system? Um, and so I, I agree that it would be good to have some mechanism for that. And whether that means we need a task force for a particular paper that we just kind of roll the group from paper to paper or whether that looks more like a work group, I think the work we see here from, from what Arun has been able to coordinate shows there's a lot of value we can add to the maintainers with, with, what, with what these guys are doing. Cool. Arno? Yeah, as a side note, I mean, you said we got rid of working groups. I, I've heard that before. This is not accurate, right? I mean, we still have working groups. What we did is we removed the, um, the constraint for working groups to have some deliverables and say, okay, if you have a deliverable and it's fairly you know, time bounded, you should create a task force dedicated to that deliverable within that time frame. But working groups were left alone and turned into more like long-term discussion groups. And the fact is they are more or less all in limbo and it may give us the impression that well, they just don't exist and we got rid of them. But technically we have not gotten rid of them. Okay, I'll have to look up the history and see what the exact voting was, but yeah, that, I can't remember Dan the exact vote on it was. Like, Dano, I fell for that trap myself. Um, if you go back in the email list in like November, 2019, you can see exactly what happened. We came very close. Okay, so we can still have them. Um, cool, Bobby had her hand up. Bobby, we can't hear you. I wonder if she's in her car and they got the radio instead of her. That, that's what I would guess. It sounded like a guy talking on a radio. Um, come off mute. Hello? She's got the wrong input on her phone, it looks like. Sorry, Bobby, still can't hear you. Okay, I'll try. Oh, oh. oh now, now you got it. That's right. Welcome you go. Back. I'm actually not in my car. I'm on my computer. I don't know why that happened. Um, but for, for me, I'm just uh, the learning materials working group was one of the active uh, working groups when that ruling came down in 2019. And basically um, everybody is correct in saying that the removal was just the fact that we had work product due. So uh, I know my group is here to onboard newcomers and collect obviously learning materials. Um, so it's kind of permeates through all of the different projects and groups and that's why we keep going. And I think the task force for security um, issues might be the same kind of thing where it's beneficial to all the different um, projects that are going on, um, my thoughts. So yeah, we still meet every week. We still have, um, we have four entrants into the global forum. We're working on the document uh, task force. So we still keep moving. Uh, we just don't report to anybody anymore. Okay. That, that's good to hear. Um, Arun, you've had your hand up for a while. Right. I was searching for these reactions on while well, sharing the screen. So I think I feel, I, I see a value in how, I don't know if we want to call it a working group or if working group structure does not exist anymore, but I definitely see a value in having a group of um, members from each project, whether they are designated as security mavens from each project or not, having mm -hmm. them meet regularly. And um, we want to establish an ecosystem where everybody shares what they have found from their project and share their learnings with others or probably 
just learn from others and see what other communities outside IP Ledger are trying to do and probably come up with um, better measures. Some of that could also include uh, involving, I mean, running a community meeting like that would also help in a way to take feedback from the people who are using those projects. So they can come in, they can add their comments and that can go in as a feedback. Uh, even if it is, let's say a meeting run once per month, which means just 12 hours in a year, that's still a value add uh, to the community. So if there is no framework to create a task, I'm uh, sorry, working group, I would still recommend that we come up with a mechanism to have this group functional. Yeah, I'm, I've got some of the details on that now too. So yeah, we can we can form them. It's just the work product that is the key differentiator that working groups don't have work product and they don't need to do quarterly reports. Because back in the olden days of TSC before my time, I think the working groups had to do a quarterly report too, which got cumbersome. Um, cool. Any other questions or comments? Um, I'll make a point to call into this uh, task force tomorrow and see if we want to go down the formal working groups uh, step um, and work through some of these tasks. So, all right. <clears throat> I think the next uh, item on the agenda is mine, uh, my task force, uh, Projects Gaps Task Force. So, we had a couple of meetings um, off, off, off schedule, not off schedule, off week, off meeting, off TSC. And from that and the TSC, we did a bunch of discovery. So I put together a synthesis of all the things that I heard. It was mostly a listening session to see what it is. And I tried to develop some of the themes. And first, I'm going to read through the, the top bullet points of this document and then come back and have a discussion on each one of them. But the first question is, uh, there's a few structural questions I think we need to answer before we can come up with firm recommendations. Uh, the first structural question is, what's the viability or appetite of a top-level project that services quote a single chain or only one type of a DLT. Um, there is there's a that deep well to answer on that question of what if and what if not. Um, the next question is what about gaps that are actually features of a project rather than a standalone project? How do we want to address that? And I think the third question is more of an existential question: is how close to the core of DLT code does a project have to be? Is you know hyperledger enterprise blockchain? What does that really mean? We've had a lot of focus these past few years on building DLTs from the ground up. But part of that could have been because enterprise DLTs really didn't exist five years ago when, when this whole project started up. So there was a lot of bootstrapping going on. And now that the bootstrapping is done, do we look forward? And what do we look forward to? So I identified about five major themes from the discovery. Um, you can scroll down a bit to try and get as many of those in there. And I ordered these basically kind of like a stack from quote unquote further away from the DLT cord down to the DLT code itself. Uh, there are multiple mentions of end user focused features like wallets. Um, we've heard this before in this meeting. Um, secret storage, um, how to handle that, credential storage, uh, the various in the various scope of the end user, um, how they're using it. You know, enterprises have different needs for their signing supports than say a single end user trying to present an identity card to prove that they're 21 and can get in the concert venue um, versus the department you know, showing that they have purchasing authority. Um, so there's scopes on some of those wallets and end user usability issues where they could be using you know, identity and DLT sort of stuff, but how do we you know, solve that last mile problem with the UX? The second category below end user and user experience issues um, are what I would call applications. This would be like something you would build on top of a DLT. And the two scopes are like the general app feature libraries. Like you might want to have a, a, a library that will help you do tokens in the various and you know work with tokens in the front end of your UI, your UI code or in your back end code, NFTs and various UX libraries to build these applications, build these um, processes for what in Ethereum is called dApps. And I don't quite know if there's an exact equivalent in Fabric or in Sawtooth or in any of the other blockchains. Um, and the scope of the DAP is different because it could literally be your purchasing system is, is what, what's interacting with. And the next category of application 
are basically domain specific toolkits. I put supply chain up there as the first one because grid's kind of covering that already. So that's not really a gap. But there's other commonly talked about areas such as provenance and proving that you know this was registered this time or this was recorded here. And finally, exchanges um, to get the token theme, which is really, really hot right now. Um, you know, help people do DEXs or, sex, or uh, CEX or centralized exchanges. Um, if this is, you know, something, you know, I don't know if we want to get into it or not, but it's a potential gap and that's just questions we need to answer. Um, the middle of the stack is cross-chain interoperability. We already have Cactus and uh, some other projects in labs such as Weaver and um, UE that address this cross-chain interoperability problem. And, you know, I think we got some good work going on with the projects and just need some more crystallization as to what is being provided and if there's any more gaps coming in there. And I think the three big themes that are coming in there are interoperating between private ledgers, interoperating between a public ledger and a private ledger, and interoperating between two public ledgers. Um, the public ledgers, you know, traditionally be um, the stuff that's in the, you know, what we consider the, uh, the non-enterprise blockchain stuff, but there's more pressure to get enterprises to use those chains, even though there's huge issues with space and expense, um, there's still a lot of drive and gravity towards it. And there's some solutions there, such as layer twos and other interesting things. Um, so that's be a, a question of, of how enterprises could access those and still access their private data and keep it in sync. Below that is a category of, of tools I would call related to operating and running a chain. I originally had this in two groups. <laughs> one designed around people who were standing up a chain for the first time and, and delivering the application and then they move it on to the operating team. But really those are just the same category of tasks and the same layer of tasks. You don't operate, you don't write the DLT code, but you work directly with the DLT code to either set it up or make sure things are going. And this is where it kind of gets a little fuzzy into the what's a project and what's a feature of a DLT. So this is, you know, for, for projects that come in here, you know, orchestration can show value outside of plain old um, working with DLT. And we got a couple of those um, as, as incubating projects and as um, as uh, labs projects already. Yeah, there are some other non, non hyperledger projects that exhibit some of these things. So there's, there's some questions there. And finally, there's the base layer. Um, a request that is coming regularly when we have these gaps is trying to create a common consensus interface. So that if you have raft, or a various a new version of, of BFT, or if you want to use a proof of stake algorithm and somehow integrate it with your, your generic backend. Um, and in the uh, in in, in a, the the Ethereum world and outside the Ethereum world, there's a big push towards something called modular blockchains, um, where you would have you would uh, basically have another blockchain handle your security, and you would just handle uh, the transaction process. Yeah. And a model like that is where a common consensus interface from, from uh, Hyperledger could be useful because then you can plug it into something that the enterprises can use and be comfortable with and use the existing tool. So it provides an opportunity to, for people to assemble stuff. And finally, of course, there is the new DLTs. Um, it's been said that we're kind of full with DLTs, but if there's something really interesting coming along that we would be interested. So um, you know, just, just reiterating uh, uh, what's been said before. Uh, on that. So it's just listing the complete thing of where the projects that I would expect Hyperledger to be able to present from the synthesis that people might want. I haven't gone through and identified which labs correspond to which one of these categories. It's probably the next task in the next uh, off-chain meeting here in a couple of weeks. Um, but there is one final topic to what is out of scope. And these have been standing, I think these three big things have been standard uh, since the dawn of Hyperledger. And I don't see them changing. And there might be things to grow to it, but I'm not sure much needs to grow out of that. Um, the first thing that's out of scope is operating a public network. A Hyperledger is not going to run a Hyperledger network. Um, the next is hosting a specific application. Hyperledger is not going to host a specific uh, a specific DAP to do identity problems. Uh, that's not what they're in. Hyperledger writes the software. They don't run the application. And finally, um, something that was discussed um, it hasn't had any reason to change it, is that Hyperledger is not a standards body. Um, they're more of a research and development, software development, uh, collaborative, and standards is, is a very, very different beast than the sort of things that I've seen going on in Hyperledger. So those I think would be the three things that would be out of scope. So, um, 
Any comments at the top level before we go back and, and discuss the open questions? All right, seeing that, let's just start with the first structural question. Oh, Marie's got a hand up. Sorry, the, sorry, Dano, just the point though, I mean, uh, the ARIES group is developing a specification. But is it like so, a ISO standard? No, of course not. And nobody right. you know, could do that here, but you could develop a specification which is then submitted to some <laughs> other standards organizations for standardization. Right. Right. So that probably is something worth, um, let me bring up my thing so I can edit it. That is worth mentioning as a sub point on there. Um, let me log in. Uh, I'm logged in. I'm not logged in. I am logged in. Edit. So um, I, I, I will point out, and this, this is just to expand on, <clears throat> sorry, uh, Daniel and Arno's point. Uh, Hyperledger would need a completely different legal structure to, to have standards and be a standards body. And the rules would be completely different from what we have now. So yes, producing something that becomes a standard is you know one thing and being a standards body and issuing standards is uh, another. Thank you. Yep, cool. And Arun? Had his hand up and it went back down. I guess I answered that question. So I, I was about to ask the same question. Um, okay. Yeah, that's cool. So going back to the top, the first question is, and this is an open question for the TSC and anyone else on the call, is what is the appetite for quote unquote single chain top level projects? Um, I've seen that one of the standards being applied to stuff that are DLTs is that they need to have applicability to multiple types of DLTs. Um, I guess is one way to phrase it as a type of a DLT, rather than just being a project that provides services to just say the Ethereum network or say to Sawtooth or to just Indy. Um, Cause that's, in, that was in the charter for Explorer and for Composer was that they were supposed to be multi-chain. Is that something we still want to continue with? Do we think it's going to work? <laughs> Has it been working? Has it not been working? Nathan. Um, my contention is if those projects were sub projects of Fabric, they probably would have been more successful. Um, I don't know that that's true because I'm not close enough to what's going on in Fabric to know. But we have had projects that we treat a lot like this on the Aries, Hyperledger Aries side. Indy doesn't have this so much as Aries does because Aries works on the peer to peer protocol part of digital identity. Um, and so we have you know, repositories that handle just like the mobile edge wallets. We have uh, repositories that handle particular um, programming languages, libraries and integrations. And the group works together fairly well because of standards efforts that exist outside of Hyperledger um, at DIFF because of some of the standards things we pointed out. Um, but the code gets implemented at Hyperledger first and the standards tend to follow what's already in the code. Um, because it's hard to standardize something you haven't tried before. Um, and you know, so I, I think that this is viable, but it does introduce kind of a, a, a level of abstraction into our governance model that we need to be prepared for um, in order to make it work well. Because I think even now in Aries, there's some governance issues that have come up because not all the frameworks are always in sync are always working on the same stuff, the same feature set. Okay, so let me post a hypothetical question to it, illustrate one of the questions I have and we need to get an answer. Let's say I want to write an identity wallet and it integrates with the Luna blockchain and I want to be part of Aries. And y'all are like, uh, no. How do we handle that? And that's a really good question. So far with Aries, the answer has been the, the goal of the project is to, to keep everyone as interoperable as we can. Um, so you're unlikely to get a no. So we haven't hit that problem in particular because we've been bending over backwards to be as inclusive as we can be. Um, but that raises this kind of second level governance question of how do we deal with you know irreconcilable differences perhaps. Like if the Go framework folks decide that the cryptography that the Rust folks are using isn't suitable in Go, and they want to do something completely different. You know, it, it, how, how do we reconcile 
issues where they don't want to be compatible anymore. Right. Or, you know, Aries is, is making a point to be compatible with everyone that comes along, but um, what if, you know, um, there's some Ethereum project and we, the basic team say, it's like, uh, that is nowhere near what we do. Um, we don't think you should be a sub-project of us. Um, like uh, an NFT storefront. And we're like, that has nothing to do with an Ethereum client. Why does it need to be under a project? How should we handle that? I don't know that I have a, a good answer to that. I think you're right okay. that the themselves have to decide. Um, and I don't think anyone can force it on them, right? Um, because the all the projects for all the the sub projects for instance under aries do coordinate across each other and they're part of aries because they're working on something that where they want to be interoperable and stay interoperable over time and if if you don't have that quality it's really difficult to to make something sustainable okay so we'll leave that question as depends um each situation is going to be different we'll see to that um, single chain projects should try and work with who their single chain is, um, but we're not going to force it on people. So what about features that are more like gaps, uh, project gaps that are more like features for standalone projects, such as, um, and the one I'm specifically thinking about is observability. Because uh, you could take, you know, your existing project and you could integrate um, Prometheus or OpenTelemetry um, observability features in there. Does is that something that requires um, a separate subproject? Now maybe it does or maybe it doesn't. But what what you know what ability do we have to tell a particular subproject you need to add this feature? Do we? Can we recommend it and hope they do it? Arun. It's a good question, and when you currently look, when we currently look at uh, all the projects that are under Hyperledger, I don't see we have that many projects that can say, "Hey, we do have scope defined for observability um, clearly." Right. So, some of, I mean, this topic specifically has to be an independent project that can stand alone, and it's fine even if they start supporting initial set of projects, but the adoption depends on how the tool itself is is probably defined um let's say let's say a project starts supporting fabric to start with and then eventually people who start using it they like it and then they see oh there is a value for me to extend or add a plugin that can start supporting this additional project that i like but okay. observability itself is a big question and it's a big concern as well that has been brought up multiple times yeah. All right. So I think a, a, a third question to ask here um, is how close to DLT core code does a project need to be? Um, if there's a, you know, some of these higher level features like uh, cross chain compatibility can work without having to touch DLT code if it's using the right interfaces. The applications will. If it has to mess with the DLT code, then it's not really an application. It's a customization of the chain. And these end user wallets, I mean, there's no way on earth they can hope to change the DLT code. Um, are these viable projects for Hyperledger? Do we want them? And how far up the chain do we want to go? Do we want to go all the way eventually today? I know. Yeah, so we touch a little bit at the, you know, on the topic when uh, was it greed came about. Uh, you know, it wasn't clear does that even belong here, and we actually raised the question all the way to the governing board, and then it was like, yeah, they're like, that's fine, you can do that. I think initially, honestly, there was, uh, you know, the members that created the Hyperledger were a bit, you know, unsure about how far we should go as an open source community because there was this notion that we all wanted to be able to 
you know, have uh, developed the, you know, uh, additional layers on top on which we could actually, you know, license and make money off. And so there was this idea that hyperledger should focus on the lower level. I don't think that's so true anymore. Things have changed. I mean, blockchain has become more of a commodity and uh, I don't think that the, the it matters as much and I don't think there will be as much reluctance to going up the stack a bit as there used to be. Jim? Yeah, um, I definitely feel the same way here that uh, if we look at cloud native uh, as sort of um, a model community, they've got hundreds of projects, um, many top level ones um, spending very deep in the stack uh, and pretty wide. Um, and for the blockchain space, I think we're still in the early days, right? We're just barely passing the adoption of the DLT layer and uh, common patterns are just starting to merge uh, further up the stack. I think we should sort of have an open arm posture to you know all kinds of proposals uh, anywhere in the stack. Um, so you know, I, I feel like that that's how we build a vi vibrant community to have people with good ideas and high quality code to feel Hyperledger is the place to be if they want to contribute to somewhere. Uh, no. Yeah, also in terms of, I think it's kind of a natural evolution for Hyperledger to expand the scope because, you know, as things become more mature at the low level, there isn't that much new development that's going to happen at that lower level unless we expand the scope to embrace other layers. I think we're going to be, you know, we're going to have a shrinking community because there isn't going to be that much stuff to do anymore. I mean, when I look at Hyperledger Fabric, I mean, we are, you know, we still have some features we're adding, but the pace of those, right, has, has drastically uh, decreased. And uh, I think the same is probably true in other frameworks. And it will be anyway at some point. So I think it is to our benefit to expand the scope for literally like the survival. It, it sounds a bit uh, too dramatic, but the, the more like, you know, the, uh, the, the, the evolution of the organization. Nathan? Well, and I think we, we ought to look at where are the exciting or interesting things happening. Um, I know that for the identities part of the, of the system, a lot of work has gone elsewhere because the application layer has been out of scope. And there's a lot of interesting things happening for healthcare credentials and for other use case specific items that, you know, parts of what they're doing probably should live at Hyperledger, but other parts might be better off where, they, where they've found a home because they've been able to find more um, use case experts or um, um, domain specific experts where they ended up. Um, so I guess so some of the question that I'm hoping we answer from this list is what gets the, the most interesting folks to participate at Hyperledger and choose to house their cool new ideas here as opposed to anywhere else? Dano, I don't know if you're aware that you're muted, but if you're saying anything, we're not hearing you. You're right, I am muted. So I'll repeat everything I just said. Um, so that gets to the fourth uh, question that I just thought of during this that I think is gonna um, enlighten some of the project gaps. Um, 
what is the appetite for inviting projects in that have existing code? I know that's how BASU came in. We were a project in a consensus and uh, there was an identified gap that there was a great need for an Ethereum type DLT in Hyperledger. Um, and we came over, we were Pantheon, we came over as Hyperledger BASU and now we're housed in Hyperledger and have a strong firm identity as Hyperledger BASU now. Um, is this a process that is uh, that works? Do we want to continue doing it, or do we want to, you know, how 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 committed are we to greenfield versus brownfield projects? I guess would be one way to look at it. I, I'll speak historically. Um, I'd say we're about uh, eighty twenty. Uh, Brown versus green. Uh, I assume by uh, a, a lot of this code has come in fairly well developed. I, I'm trying to think of the completely brand new projects that jumped out of Hyperledger and were first developed there. And I, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. I don't know. Uh, someone else may remember something. Right, I think you're right. I think it might even be higher. Um, everything was either brought in or forked off from something that was brought in. Yeah, I was I was trying to think of like any of if there are any lab projects that came in as nothing and developed into something that became a, a project. And I, I just maybe you're right. Maybe it's a hundred percent. It might. It's probably pretty close. I'm sure there are there are a lot of labs, and I'm sure there are some that started with very little, but it's it's going to be high okay. uh, that doesn't mean we always have to be that way but that's just what's happened historically yeah if you look at i have another org um where i park inbound code bases and uh you know there's a lot of them okay so um we're coming up on time. Um, I think we got some good questions on some of these structural questions, which I think are probably more important than drilling down on each particular project gap. Um, the next off cycle meeting is going to be the third Tuesday. I'm going to look at my calendar. Um, it's going to be in June, and I think I'll be in town for that. I think it's the 21st. No, it's going to be the 14th. So, um, if people are interested, um, I'd encourage you to come on this uh, specific page. And if you can think of projects that um, are not in Hyperledger that might fill in these, that might be willing to come in, um, leave them in the comments so we can get a list of um, gaps we can either solicit Greenfield or see if there's other projects that we might want to solicit to come in and, and grow the team and grow the family. Um, yeah, any, any closing comments from anyone? Okay, um, if there are none, um, go ahead and close the meeting a few minutes early. Uh, thanks everyone for coming. I will see you again next week. Thanks a lot, Dano.